Welcome, folks. Bless the Lord today. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land, too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in this world, which is going through so much turmoil and so sickness and sorrow and grief, that we are reassured by how you have revealed yourself, that you are the one who holds it all in your hands. The world is in your hands, Lord, and uh, we are greatly comforted by knowing that. So help us, Lord, today as we come to worship uh, to make the sacrifice of praise, to choose to worship you, knowing that you have got the whole world in your hands. So let's begin by singing that. He's got the whole world in his hands.
Here are the comforting words that our Savior Jesus says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. As the Apostle Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying that everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the beloved disciples, John says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for us, for our sins.
by still waters, inviting us to new adventures, and you guide us along paths of justice and peace. Through the shadows of death, you send your comfort and courage to relieve our tears and fears. We know you are always with us. Here, you call us together as your people, and so we offer you our praise. Receive our worship this day in the name of Christ, 
your Son and our Savior. And empower us by your Spirit to continue following him. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So, in our house, we always kept the Christmas tree up until the 6th or 7th of January. And my mother always says, oh, that's because uh, that's Ukrainian Christmas. But li liturgically, it's not. It's, uh, it's keeping the Christmas tree up and the decorations up until Epiphany, which was the feast that celebrates the visit of the Magi, which happened, of course, not according to the, the uh, nativity scene where the, where the wise men showed up at the manger, but happened probably somewhere between one and two years after. And, you know, all through the year I talk about, you know, trust God and pray about what you want to give and, or what, you, what he wants you to give, not what you want to give, because we all want to give more than we can. And he'll provide for you, but you know, it's, those can be empty words sometimes. So once a year I like to share this scripture. It's, this one is from Matthew. And it describes the visit of the Magi to, to the house where Jesus was. And it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now it's important to notice the chronology here. The, uh, when the wise men left, the angel spoke to Joseph in a dream and said, pack up everything and head for Egypt. But how many of us today would be able to just pack up everything and, and run away to another land without some sort of uh, pre-planning, saving a little money here and there, hiding it away from the kids because they'll always want something and all that kind of stuff. But here is the perfect example of God's provision. Joseph was obedient to what God wanted and God provided what they needed to go to Egypt. So the, the Magi come, they give their treasures. We don't know how much it was. Surely it was enough that they could carry it because they had to use that to live on in Egypt. But it is definitely, in my mind, the greatest example of God's provision for our needs in our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you, your promises are yes and amen. And if you promise that you'll provide for us, we can rely on that promise. Lord, that gives us the ability to follow you in obedience, your desire for us to be generous in this life. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that encouragement and this example. Uh, thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you all so much for uh, your feeling for each other. And many of you barely know OJ, and yet you, you act like you do. And because she's my friend, I feel like you've honored him. And um, there really are no words to express. But I believe that the church of our Lord Jesus is called to care about each other. If we don't care about each other, we don't care about anything. We're called to care. Even as the Lord Jesus had compassion on this world, so we are called to have compassion for each other. And I, th I thank you. 
You know, as I um, reflect, um, closing down one year and starting another, I tend to look back over my day timer from the previous year. Sometimes sermon notes, I go back over my sermons and look and see what we talked about here in this little church. And then I wonder, well, what's going to happen in this year, 2022? We're nine days in. And most of us, I don't think, really know what's around the corner. Sometimes God reveals to us what's maybe coming around, but <clears throat> many would say, well, I hope for a better year than the year past. But I would question, what is a better year? What I'm wondering most of all is that <clears throat> who will God put in yours and my path this year, 2022? so that we may influence them for the kingdom. Not about how hot or how dry the summer's going to be or could be, how many forest fires there's going to be licking at our heels, or floods, or pandemic, or sickness, or discouragement, or even despair, but that what opportunity will God give you and I? And I will say this prophetically, God will give you opportunity. He always has, and he always will. And so may we, this year as we get into it more involved, may we be looking and seizing opportunities, embracing them, not so that we can make more money, although there's nothing wrong with that. Make all the, can all the money you can. My adage that I always say, there's nothing wrong with making money. Make all you can. Don't get caught up in it. But what's most important is what opportunities has God given you to help with the good news of Jesus around the world? And you, you may be in touch with only one person that wants to receive Jesus. I don't know what God's going to do in your life. But I'm absolutely certain he will bring opportunities to you. And may we never despair because we're a, a small church in the valley. We are the church in the valley. And however small, however seemingly insignificant we may be, Church, I'm telling you something. We are never, ever, ever insignificant in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ever. This little group is significant. I know you pray. Carry on praying. Carry on encouraging. We know we are called to encourage one another. We talked about it this past few months. Encourage each other. When I came into my office and sat down, I was going over my thoughts this morning. <clears throat> the music team had finished, and Wilf came into my office, and he sat down to encourage me because he knew I was having a hard morning because of the news I had about my friend. That's encouragement. Don't ever say. Please, church, don't ever say. There's nothing at church for me on a Sunday morning. Church isn't, a, isn't necessarily a place for us to always say, what can I get out of it? But what can I give? What can I contribute to the body today? And I want to tell you something. You, right now, where you're sitting, are contributing to the body of Christ because your presence is here. You're encouraging our prayers. 
You're encouraging our hearts, our soul, our being. So may we never get caught up in the lie that the devil tells us, you don't need to go to church today. I'm not judging anybody who stays home from time to time. Sometimes that has to happen. Sometimes God's calling you to a um, Sunday morning of rest. Do that. Rest, pray, however, however many need, weeks you need. It's not about that. It's about when you're here, God is doing a good thing. I want to talk today. One thing I want to say. One thing I, another thing I absolutely know is that we're one day closer to when Jesus will come and blow the final trumpet. We're a year closer, a day closer. And I, I think I'm going to be talking quite a bit about that this year, 2022, about getting closer to the final day. But today I, I want to talk about the backstory of Christmas. We've talked for a few weeks about the Christmas nativity, about the Christmas story. But what I want to talk about now is what was Jesus doing before he was born as a baby? So often we think of Jesus as the little helpless little baby in the manger. What was he doing before that? And I want to talk for a little bit about that today. And I think the, the quick answer to what was Jesus doing before he came to earth, I think he was, I think he was preparing. Preparing for that which was ahead. Jesus said in John 14, we know it well, do not let your heart be troubled. Words of Jesus. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Jesus' life, we know it, we know it. Jesus' life did not begin in the manger. I'm here to remind us that that is not accurate. But as we come out of the Christmas season, can we think of what God was doing in the eons of time before he even created us? And there's all kinds of speculation and I can almost guarantee that there's never going to be a man, woman, or child that is ever going to know entirely what God was doing before he created. But Jesus said he went away to prepare a place for you and I. Before we were born, he prepared a place. He made a place for us to spend eternity with him. That is the most encouraging thing we can ever believe. Whether we're a teenager, whether we're a middle-aged person or an old person, we need to be ready to spend that destiny in, with Jesus in eternity. And that is our only hope. We know as we look back in the book of Genesis... We know that God is creator of all, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first four words of the Bible, and never forget this. In the beginning, God. You know what that means? That means that in the beginning, God existed. And then somewhere in that great area of time, he began creating, but before he began creating, he existed. Because he created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then later on in that chapter, God said, 
let us make man in our image. Who is the us? It's the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, what I want to bring to our attention is Genesis 1.1 is a remark. I'm going to rephrase that. John 1.1 is a remarkable, remarkable uh, mirror of Genesis 1.1. Thousands and thousands of years later, John the Apostle writes this, and we know it. I'm not going to tell you anything new this morning. Most of you know the scriptures as well as I do. You read them, you think about it. I'm just trying to remind us the similarities, what happened at creation. It says here, in the beginning was the word. Now the word is Jesus. That's what the translation is. It's not the word of God. It's not the presence of God. The word means Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus was, which means in the beginning, he existed. So in the beginning was the word, and the word, Jesus, was with God, and the word, Jesus, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Light will win over darkness every time, because light extinguishes darkness. It doesn't matter how dark the room is. It doesn't matter how dark the cave is. When you turn on a light, the darkness is forced to disappear. And isn't it interesting in Genesis 1-1, the scripture says, God came and he said, he declared, let there be light, and there was light. And then John goes on to say here, in him was life, and life was the light of men. Jesus came that spiritual darkness would be totally disappeared. There doesn't need to be any more spiritual darkness ever again because Jesus is the light and he came to be the light and put light in us that we too become the light of the world. My question to us in 2022, are you and I going to be the light of the world? Are we going to show the dark places into light that others may see the light that leads us to eternal life. The Christmas story did not begin in Bethlehem. It started in the whole, Jesus' home in glory, in the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit. He left his home in heaven and arrived in a feeding trough. I'm thinking that the glorious home of heaven was a pretty nice place. It's interesting how us in our Western culture were striving to get the best house we can. Our home is the most important possession we have, wouldn't you say? We like our homes. And we like to make them warm, comfortable, attractive. Now, some people get carried away. I know of a few television preachers that have got carried away and they have houses that are worth 10 or 15 million dollars. I don't care. But that's a pretty important part of their life. And then the scriptures talk about the mansions. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Some translations say, in my father's house are many mansions. Now how... How is anybody going to match that? Is your house going to match that? Is mine? Is the richest people in the world's house, are they going to match the glorious place where Jesus lived? That would be our home one day. It doesn't matter if we're living in a small house, a big house. It doesn't matter if we're living in a tent or a cottage. 
because if we're an embracer and a follower of Jesus, we are going to share the house of the Lord. But my point is this this morning, that Jesus left his home and glory because he loved you and I. He left in order to come here. And this was surely his plan from the very beginning of eternity. Even as he was creating. Yes, remember, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were creating. I want to tell you this morning, regardless of how well you think you know Jesus, regardless of how well you may know the Scriptures, would it be fair to say you could probably get to know him better? He could. Would it be fair to say you could probably read a little more scripture in your life? Is that fair to say? Probably true. You could probably even pray a little bit more. Right? You probably could. So bless us for considering that. We can and we must get better acquainted with the Jesus that came to where we are. He was willing to leave his home and glory to come into a stable and be born in a feeding trough. And we need to get to know him better. I need to get to know him better. How am I going to do that? We have his book. We have his letter that he wrote to the world. He wrote it to you and I for us. When I met Karen, she lived in Edmonton. I remember when I decided I was going to start to write to her, which wasn't very long after I met her. She's only 15. I was 19. And I remember one or two people saying, why would you want a girlfriend in Edmonton? Well, because that's the one I thought my heart was going to fall in love with. And we did almost all our courtship on by mail. I'm not sure what she did with my letters, but I want to tell you what I did with her letters. I embraced them. I would never pick a, her letter out of, the, out of the mail and open it in front of people. I'd go to the privacy of my room or outside under a tree if it was summer, and I'd read it because it's just for me. And I, I would read it again. And then I'd read it again. And I think I remember putting those letters under my pillow once in a while. They were certainly at my desk beside my bed, bedside table, because I could not get enough of it. Until finally, we were married. We have his letter. And if we want to get better acquainted with him, we're going to have to reread the letters. We may say, oh, I've heard that before. How, ma how many of you know John 3.16? We all know it. Are, are you tired of it? It's old news, but it's still good news. And so... We have access to the very words that will show us who Jesus is, who God is through Jesus. We have the book of life, the book of hope in our hands. We need to read it. We need to enjoy reading it. We need to digest it. We need to put it inside our heart. I want to go to the last part of the scripture I'm going to share is in the Philippians. Uh, Philippians in chapter 2. Paul starts with this eternity long ago, the Father's presence. 
And he gives us four characteristics of Jesus as God. I don't think i got to stand here before you today to proof text that Jesus is in fact God. I'm doubtful if anybody is questioning that. What I'm trying to show is the significance of that. So you know uh, Philippians 2 really well. We talk about it a lot. I've preached from it. You know about it. You've taught me things about it, many of you. But here Paul says this to us. Have this attitude in yourselves. So he's talking about yours and my attitude. <clears throat> we all have attitudes. Good, good attitudes or bad attitude. Sometimes we wake up in the morning with a bad attitude. Watch out, spouse. Watch out, children. Daddy's having a bad attitude day. Stay clear of me. Hopefully that doesn't happen very often with you, but sometimes it does. So this is the attitude that the Apostle Paul is telling us to have. Have this attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus. So we learn our attitude from Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Or to be hung on to. But he emptied himself. Taking the form of a bondservant. And being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. To the point of death. Even death on a cross. So I'll just quickly go through the four thoughts. The, the God who serves. We know that Jesus came, he said, I came to serve, right? Remember that? What, what was Jesus doing one day with his disciples? He's washing their feet, for goodness sakes. I can say, well, I'm here to serve you as their pastor. Once or twice, I've washed church members' feet. But I don't think anybody here, I've, I don't think I've ever offered to wash your feet. And I don't think you want me to wash your feet. And I don't think we need to. But yes, that's the heart of Jesus. That's what servants did in those days. We don't have to imitate those things. We don't have to show our feet off to people and allow someone to, to wash them. Nothing wrong with that. In Jesus' day, though, that was the habit of what you did for your guests. And Jesus took on that place as servant of the household and washed the feet of his disciples. And some of them didn't like it. Jesus, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, don't tell me what to do. I will wash your feet something to do with the heart. The God who serves. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Second one is, the God who departed from heaven and arrived in the manger. Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not do it in a way that could be grasped, that could be hung on to. He let something go from himself. And as he existed in the form of God, he emptied himself. The God who sacrifices did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And then he says that the fourth one is the God who empties himself. Because he went on, he, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So the one, the God who serves. Two, the God who departed and arrived. The God who sacrifices. The God who emptied himself. 
And he's talking about Jesus. This is what Jesus did. He did all things for you and I. I don't know when you think about that, what did I, because you, you know that passage. But as I was preparing that this week, it humbled me. When Jesus, you did that for me. You know, I can't stand before here, you this morning, or any morning. I got absolutely nothing to ever brag about. I can't stand here and say, this is what you need to do. Anything you need to do, I need to do. I don't require anything more from you than I require of myself. If I cannot humble myself before God, I've got no business standing here talking to you about God. I want to carry on just because I love this fast passage so much. <clears throat> Next verse in verse 9. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, you're going to confess Jesus now or later. Confess Jesus now and get saved or confess him later and not get saved. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I can prophesy that because it's here. It's going to happen. So I'm reminding us today. Confess his name often. Bow your knee often to the Lord Jesus, who is your Lord and Savior. Jesus said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus laid aside his life for you and I. The King of kings and the Lord of lords left his throne to come to a stable in a feeding trough for me. Just for me. And he would have come if I was the only one on earth. He did it for you. You know it. But can we be pulled in a little bit more? Jesus set aside his home and glory. So that he could come where we are. Left the presence of the Father. To spend 33 years here. I close today with Matthew 6.10. That one little verse in the Lord's Prayer. The words of Jesus says. Your kingdom come. O Lord. Your will be done. Where? In heaven? Of course the Lord's will will be done in heaven. That's where the Lord lives. But he goes on, your will be done on earth, right here, even as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. Lord came to where we are. Jesus came to where we are. He didn't even ask us to go and do all these extraordinary things. He just said, I will come to where you are, even if it's being born in a feeding trough. I don't know. Me, me spending time, I can see, I mean, you realize Jesus really loves me a lot. And... Can a child just move us a little bit closer? A little, a little closer to the manger? A little closer to the throne of heaven? So we don't live just for the, what we're doing. We, you know, we're all busy. We're all busy people. It is easy 
to get caught up in busyness, and I do it all the time. I can't tell you, do what I do. Don't, don't do what I do. Do what God's calling you. Because I can get busy with life, and I can hardly open the Bible some days. That's not right. You've got to open the Bible every day. Have a reading plan. We've got to talk to our Lord and Savior every day. Maybe there shouldn't be, I would say this, there shouldn't be an hour when we are talking to Jesus. And by the way, I want to throw this in. You know, there's always a question. When I pray, who do I pray to? The Father, the Son, or the Spirit? You pray to God. Father, Son, and Spirit. Whose name you use is God. Jehovah, Jehovah God. Pray to the Father, pray to the Son, pray to the Holy Spirit. They're all there to answer your prayer. So we come to the Lord's Supper this morning. We do it because we know how he loved us. Today as the wafers pass, and as the cup has passed, we eat and we drink. I just want you, I'm just asking you to just think about how much he loves you. Would you do that as we partake this morning, Isaac? For a prayer, I just want to say that some of you uh, who have been reading the Daily Bread may have, some days back, read the scripture. Um, it talked about when the Hebrews were enslaved, I believe, by Babylon. Time and time again, the Israelites keep on saying, um, God, remember us. Remember our troubles. But translated into Hebrew, that word actually is pronounced zakar, which means act upon, act upon my troubles. So every time the Israelites are saying, Lord, remember us, they're saying, Lord, we're enslaved, we have troubles, we have anxieties, please, zakar, act upon our troubles. Mm -hmm. And so that's been helping me throughout the week. So if there's anyone here who feels like you have troubles, we always like to say, oh, God, help me with this. Uh, I think uh, something that could help us all is when we say, Lord, act upon my troubles. Act upon them. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have a very powerful love for us that even, even now we have trouble understanding. We ask that when we go out today, we won't just... We ask that when we go out today, Lord, that we'll be wanting to witness and wanting to stay strong and that we'll be wanting to be peacemakers wherever we go as, as peacemaking is, is so vital today in, in such a world of division. Lord, we ask that you will guide us in this nation to seek peace and not division, but that we will always stay strong in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
many of you have heard, uh, I'm happy to report that Vienna, who was here last week, is now in a hotel room in Manila, <laughs> doing her five-day quarantine, and the things, uh, there were some delays, plane delays, and uh, uh, but all ended up fine in the end, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for your prayers, and again, I, I thank you for your support for her and for her ministry and for what she has, uh, what she's done. So may God continue to bless and keep you as you are re remain faithful to him. And let's pray together. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, the one who is. Lord Jesus, we know you existed. We know that you created in the beginning, oh God. Thank you for creating the universe. Thank you for creating us. And thank you, oh God, for coming to the manger for us as man so that we could get to know you by Jesus walking amongst us. And now we read of your miracles, of your people that you raised up in that day. And we are members of that church that began on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, we are members of the same church. And Lord, we claim for the same power There was power there. And Lord, we ask for that power here. That we pray for the sick that something will happen. We pray for OJ today that something will happen in his life. That you will do the miracle that he desperately needs. That you will receive honor and glory. Lord, bless our little church. Keep us faithful to you and faithful to each other. We pray safety, health, and wellness upon our lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
God bless you all. My love to you today. Have a happy and a safe week. Thank you. Anyone who wants prayer, seek someone out. I'm going to pray for you.